One country, two systems. Used to be a blessing for Hong Kong, now a challenge. In 2019, Hong Kong experienced a months-long protest against the extradition bill. To tackle this most violent unrest since the handover, China decided to impose its own national security law in 2020, which empowers Beijing's apparatus to enforce the law on Hong Kong soil. Under the law, suspects could be extradited to mainland courts for trials, and the judges would be appointed by the government. If that's not bad enough, an ordinance was also passed to criminalize this respect of the national anthem. With political freedom under siege, it's hard to imagine that if we wind the clock back to 2017, Hong Kong almost became a democracy. So how did we come to this? Let's start from 2014, the year that Hong Kong was offered a political reform package by Beijing. According to the plan, every eligible voter could cast a vote in the next chief executive election in 2017. But wait for it, there is a catch. A pro-China election committee would be set up to make sure that no candidates hostile to China would get on the ballot. How did Hong Kong people like the plan? Well... Now I'm standing in front of the Electrical Building. Protester has built a new square every night since 14th of June. In a situation where last until the voting day of the universal suffrage proposal. Correct, you hear me right. Huge street marches were ignited, angry demonstrators occupied the city's central for three months to pressure Beijing to cancel the candidate screening process. Surrounding the legislature complex, protesters held rallies, set up tents and kiosks, and even built temporary houses. Once they realized that Beijing is not going to compromise, they demanded their MPs to veto the plan, dreading that a pseudo-democracy would push Hong Kong into indefinite darkness, and veto they did. There was a big sigh of relief when the universal suffrage proposal was voted down in Hong Kong's Legislative Council. Why were Hong Kongers so keen to cut the proposal loose? The basic law he mentioned is Hong Kong's mini constitution, the core of this unbreakable deadlock. It was exactly this basic law that enabled the Chinese rubber stamp congress to circumvent Hong Kong's parliament to legislate the security law, which authorizes the Communist Party to unprecedentedly appoint a so-called advisor within Hong Kong's National Security Committee. That means without true autonomy, even if Hong Kong became a fully democratic society, Beijing could still issue whatever policies on Hong Kong or reinterpret the basic law however it sees fit. The question is, why didn't they pass the law in 1997 when the UK returned Hong Kong to China? Why now? In 2003, demonstrators flooded the streets against the legislation of Article 23. Back then, the world had seen that Hong Kong people were peaceful. In recent years, under the influence of key opinion leaders on social media, the younger generations have adopted a more radical and violent approach. But violence is not inevitable. Pro-democracy movement could materialize in a landslide victory in the upcoming Hong Kong's parliamentary election. If Pan Democrats win the majority of seats this September, then radical voices could be legally represented by electrical deputies who run for office, not running from tear gas. That is, if the newly passed security law won't be used to disqualify pro-democracy candidates and the pro-China parties remain unpopular as they are at the moment. Democracy is rarely achieved in one go. Instead, people's political rights expand over time. However, with the security law in place to override any conflictual civil liberties, would a pseudo-democracy under one country, two systems still be able to turn into a real deal by 2047? In any case, the world is watching. If or when those little paper deers will eventually grow into horses, we'll have to wait and see. Sizewood Electrical Complex in Emerald City, Hong Kong.